Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher in Omaha, Nebraska, and my guest is Imogen Ragone, an Alexander teacher in Wilmington, Delaware. We both uh, these days teach mostly online. And uh, I have a topic that I'd like to discuss with Imogen, but as usual, I have not given her any warning. <laughs> about what the topic uh, is in the, in, in the interest of spontaneity, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe deviousness, who knows? Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so the topic I wanna talk today about and, and discuss, I have some things I wanna say, but I'm sure Imogen will have plenty of things too. Uh, the, the general topic is inhibition, Alexander Technique inhibition. Okay. <laughs> you could say that the beauty of this topic is that no matter what you say, you're going to offend somebody. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. <laughs> I mean, really, seriously, it's one of these topics where there's en endless debates about what it means and in the Alexander world. Uh, I think one thing most Alexander teachers would agree on, it is not Freudian inhibition, suppressing, no. suppressing your feelings, that kind of stuff, bottling Absolutely. stuff. In. But it's more about choice and it's more about deciding uh, that you there's something you don't want to do and you give yourself an instruction along those lines, perhaps. Or, or there are various ways to... To, to inhibit. And that's actually what I really want to talk about is, uh, and this is, I should say this is inspired by the recent uptick in interest in Margaret Goldie, Goldie's mm -hmm. work. She mm -hmm. was uh, um, a one of Alexander, FM Alexander's uh, first teachers who was trained by her even before the first training course. And she was very close to Alexander. And when Alexander died, she continued to teach for many years, and she was um, not terribly happy about what most other teaching in, in, I guess, London, where she was, was was about. She was a big believer in inhibition, although she did not, I don't know that she used that word a lot. She talked about stopping a lot, not to do, was a phrase of hers. Mm -hmm. And she felt that was absolutely primary to getting the benefits of the technique, which is not something I was exposed to on my training course. I don't know about you, but we never talked about inhibition really, or certainly not how to, how to accomplish it on my training course. Well, how, what was your experience with that concept? Huh, I am, I'm, I'm trying to remember because we definitely talked about it. But I'm, hmm. But did anyone ever give you, okay, it's a good thing to he, inhibit? How do, he, how do you do it? I remember Daria, who was my um, training course director, excellent teacher. But mm -hmm. I remember her um, one time when we were talking about it, giving the, um, I don't know. I was thinking the thing about the gearbox in the car and being in neutral, but I actually think that was a different thing. That wasn't. <laughs> that was Marjorie, Marjorie Bar, Bar Low, Alexander's yeah. take on inhibition. It was like neutral. Yeah, and the, yeah, no, Daria was used a car metaphor in a different way for something else completely. Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly do remember kind of the idea of non-doing and, and um, which seems related, especially to what you just were saying Miss Goldie was talking about. Um, and yet I also would say they're not exactly the same thing. Well, or maybe they are. I mean, <laughs> um, really you can tell that I've been put on the spot with this conversation. I just, I, I just know from my, in, in from my experience training, 
yeah, the term came up, but I don't remember anyone ever saying, well, now here's how you could, I hate to say do it because it's not something you do, but how can you um, nudge yourself into that place where you are in fact inhibiting in an effective manner? That, that seems to me to be a, a kind of an unanswered question by I'm Mark. thinking back, um, to lessons and my training course. And, you know, I don't want to do a disservice because I had a wonderful training. <laughs> um, 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 I know we talked about pausing, but it isn't just about pausing. But I certainly do think hands on work. Um, is helping the student inhibit mm -hmm. before you do something. But maybe it's not overtly talked about what is happening so much. Right. And as I said, we never discussed how you would achieve it. So to we, speak. Well, we did actually, we did play because Daria is an actor and we used a lot of games in my training okay. to, to explore different ideas. And I know we certainly used some games that had the idea of inhibition behind them, like red light, green light, Simon mm -hmm. Says, <laughs> things like that, which if right. you don't stop and think, you don't you're going to just do the habitual, the instruction, right, of, right, you know, right. so, yeah. So what, what I became interested in was, um, let me get my notes out here. Uh -huh. um, because, you know, obviously inhibition is a powerful process. But I realized that I, until really quite recently, I had not thought through how I might get to the place where I was taking advantage of that. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And so um, I'd like to go through all the ways that I'm aware of that you could that that could happen. Two of them you've already mentioned, by the way, mm -hmm. a teacher's hands and games. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put them in a category that I'm going to list various things. Oh, of uh, ways that you can learn or experience that could take advantage of this great this concept which is basically putting yourself in a mental state where you're you're not uh, you're sort of open to anything happening you're, you're not you're not deciding what's going to happen but next. it's also interrupting what might be the automatic Exactly. Pattern or response, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, um, this this interview is probably not going to make much sense to people who are not Alexander teachers or students. And I also want to say it's kind of an exploratory interview in that I have, I'm I'm grappling with the, the issue in a public way. I'm not saying I've got the, the answer, but mm -hmm. I am, I am interested in the question, how to inhibit. And um, for me personally, the way that I favor and that I find very effective is to use um, inhibitory directions. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been around for quite a while, like negative, sort of paradoxical negative directions, like you, you think to yourself, I'm not walking as you're walking, or I'm not breathing, or I'm not lying down, or whatever you're doing, you just think to yourself, I'm not doing it. And that certainly um, changes the quality of what you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say pretty much always for the better. Yes. Because and I'm thinking say no to your habitual way of doing say you're basically saying to your 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 prefrontal cortex is saying to the rest of you, uh, as as I say, for example, walk across the room saying I'm not walking. You're saying, well, come up with a better way than the one I I I'm... habitually use. I'm also thinking this type of 
direction, if you want to call it a direction, um, is inhibition a direction? <laughs> That's an open another question. Um, yeah. But I'm thinking this is the ones you can use during an activity to inhibit using the terminology, mm -hmm. the, the, the patterns or the habits that you don't want during it, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also the before an activity, like you're getting ready to get up from a chair, the kind of classic chair work thing. Mm -hmm. And you could use that sort of idea about I'm not getting up from the chair or I'm not doing, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. to lower that um, end gaining response, that eagerness to get up and mm -hmm. then help you be with the means whereby to, you know, right. which could be one means whereby could be to continue thinking I'm not Absolutely. getting up, you know, <laughs> so yeah. And, and sort of one other thing I want to say is I think inhibition is not, um, I think there are degrees of inhibition. I don't think it's a strictly binary thing. I'm either inhibiting or I'm not inhibiting. I, I agree think too. Um, some people sometimes are it able is. to do a certain amount of inhibiting and then, or certain level of it, but maybe they can't sustain it very long, or maybe they're, I, they can inhibit a bit, but not yeah. as much as but they could. They're like lessening the strength of the habit, but it's not like it's gone. <laughs> right, yes. right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and the, the particular direction that I find very helpful is uh, these days is I'm not doing, which kind of, covers everything i mean it 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 covers things that you just you just don't want to do like tighten your neck but it also covers things that you want to do differently mm. and when you think to yourself i'm not doing the rest of your body figures out which one of those is appropriate right now for that particular thing mm -hmm. you're, you're you you don't have to worry about that you just put out that thought and the rest of you takes takes over. And I think that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And, and so that's a pretty nice way to do it because you get the benefits of inhibition and you just ha have this very light thought uh, to get there. That actually um, reminds me of something because I've heard some people say that you need to know what you're inhib inhibiting to be able to inhibit. And I don't think oh. that's true. I think sometimes I can just, like you say, I could just deliver that I'm not doing, for instance. Yeah. And there wasn't anything specific that I was conscious of, and yet it helps me let go of some extra tensions, you know, yeah. that I no, wasn't I, aware I, of. I, um, I totally agree. I mean. So there's both. You can, you, you you, sometimes, you, know sometimes you know. Yep. And sometimes you don't know. And you, you don't can... need to know what all your uh, dysfunctional habits are. <laughs> Thank <laughs> goodness. <laughs> they'll be taken care of anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is that like any kind of direction, uh, it's got to be delivered in a way that's useful. And that means very light thought, very uh, no, no oomph to it. You're just saying, hey, this is what I want. Uh, and you guys figure it out. So and that, I, yeah. can I interrupt you? That strikes yeah. me that we have to inhibit our normal way, uh -huh. our habitual way of thinking to deliver the inhibitory thought in an inhibitory way. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> we do. We do. So, yeah. And uh, I think a danger of any kind of self-talk about pausing or inhibiting or whatever is that you can slightly overdo it and then you don't you, well, well let me give you an example of that that i know noticed in an interview uh, just a couple of years after i first started teaching in toronto there were a bunch of people assembled to talk about some topic i don't know back pain or something one of them was an alexander teacher mm -hmm. who i knew and they were all sitting around the table and the host was asking questions and the host asked the question of this guy and i could just see he was inhibiting 
and he inhibited just too much. And he got, he didn't get a chance to, to answer the question. Yeah. So, and I think, I think it's because maybe his idea was to, he had to do a little more than he thought he had to do to inhibit. He, mm -hmm. he had an idea he had to actually do something instead of just putting out this thought without any um, intent to, to do anything about the thought. Mm -hmm. So that, that's yeah, a, yeah. A, a little danger of, mm -hmm. of that approach. But I, but I think that for most Alexander teachers, there are some what I would call traditional Alexander ways of achieving inhibition, two of which you mentioned, as I said earlier, a teacher's hands. If a teacher's acquired that ability to do it themselves and they have hands that reflect that and they put those hands on you in a way that you can absorb that or somehow tune into it. And apparently Margaret Goldie was a master of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think in her own way, Marjorie Barstow was a master of that, although she didn't, wouldn't have called it that. So that's certainly a classic Alexander way, way to learn how to inhibit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go to a teacher who has learned and get the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Now, it, and it doesn't even have to be hands-on uh, just being in the presence of someone who is looking after themselves in that way, and maybe even the presence online. Oh, well, I, I very much agree with you that our presence um, is received by other people. If I'm all like this, you're going to feel it. If I'm, I'm hopefully, going to notice. I, at some gonna, level, I'm going to pick up on it. Yeah. And if you're in a teaching role, that it's even uh, it's a little bit more. Um, um, the emphasis on the the teachers coordination use, whatever words you want to use, is maybe a little emphasized more than the students in what is picked up and transferred mm -hmm. um however i don't know if that's inhibition if it's unconscious although maybe the hands-on is unconscious I, mm, <laughs> you're getting me into well, all sorts of mind game trouble <laughs> you see there would be teachers who'd be very upset about it being unconscious and there'd be teachers that think oh that's just fine that's a good way to do it hang out with someone who has already learned and you can benefit from it. Uh, apparently humans, we're, you know, we are designed to imitate each other. We are, yeah. And so we if we can be them. conscious of that, we can decide what we want to imitate and what we don't want to imitate. And, and as teachers, we can be, be very responsible of ourselves because we know that our students will not just be taking in the words, they will be taking in us. Us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the, we talked, we mentioned um, teachers' hands. Uh, games certainly can be used to, to get someone into a place where they're inhibiting. Uh, the kind of game, you might call it a game that FM himself engaged in that he talks about in Use of the Self, where he's, I, I forget whether he's like maybe sitting in a chair and he thinks, well, I could stand up, I could not stand up, or I could do something totally different, like raise my hand. Words, there are a bunch of things I could do. Uh -huh. So giving them all kind of equal weight. And none of them, he's not, he hasn't committed uh -huh. to any of them. So it, that commitment is what can cause the problem because you're all, if you commit to standing up even before you stand up, all kinds of stuff is kicked into place in, in your habitual way. Uh -huh. So he kind of widens the field of things you might do and then he decides to do one. Or maybe mm -hmm. he doesn't. He's never committed to it until he actually does it. 
Uh-huh. I mean, that's a pretty powerful method that he came up with. And he actually outlines it pretty clearly in Use of the Self. Anyone can, can read that. Yeah, I use not that exactly, but that same. I have a kind of an activity or game that I do with a lot of people that kind of uses uses that idea, which I have to credit Mead Andrews because it actually came from her. But obviously oh, okay. she, she got it from them. <laughs> <laughs> or it came from um, well and, you know just and to close out the category let's say of traditional alexander ways to get mm-hmm. there constructive rest is probably a pretty good way for some people uh you're especially constructive rest where you don't have to do anything so like your knees are supported by something uh, so that you're in a place where it's pretty clear that there's nothing you have to do to be there. And you could just, you can afford to let go of all kinds of ideas about what it's, what's necessary to be lying in this place. You're conscious, you're lying down with, in a particular structure that tends to encourage uh, expansion of your body without you having to worry about doing it. And and there's nothing you have to do to be there. You can just kind of um, just be there. Hmm. I never quite I thought of it like that. I, 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 mean, thought not... that, I thought that you could practice inhibition while you are in constructive rest because it gets a lot of get things get a lot clearer like for instance if you play the game of raising a hand in the air while you're lying down it's much clearer how quickly things are kicking in because you've got the feedback from the um, absolutely that's one way to do it um but that's interesting thinking of the act in itself as an inhibitory act um, well for a lot of people if yeah because inhibiting their life <laughs> yes. have, if someone's got a lot of background tension and stuff going on you want to get them to chill out before you really do any sort of formal absolutely with them. and constructive rest is a yeah. is a pretty good way to do that i agree so you might say it's a pre-inhibitory it could be a pre-inhibitory process mm-hmm. Being putting yourself in a place where you could inhibit more easily, something mm. like that. So those are those are the kind of. Can you think of any other kind of traditional Alexander ways to achieve inhibition? Because those are the only ones I've come up with. Traditional. Well, yeah. that, that any Alexander teacher listening would say, "Oh yeah, I know about that." Or student, yes, that's something I, that I use or know about. Because I, I can't think of any others, but off I bet the top of my off the top of my head, I, I can't. No. OK, well, then let's move to the non-traditional <laughs> ones. <laughs> um, and uh, one that c- crossed my mind is meditation. Uh, that can certainly take you to a place of quietness, mm-hmm. which might be pretty akin to Alexander inhibition. I don't know. It's it. I to me, it seems like it does. It does take away a lot of the you know internal chatter that's going on in my head just to to meditate for fifteen or twenty minutes. Um, it's possible that drugs could do it. I don't know. I mean, I I, I could imagine that it, they might, and that that might not be the best strategy, but it might work. And the, for me personally, the, the non-Alexander method that has actually where I've really felt like I really was inhibiting or in that space of inhibition has been cranial sacral therapy, hmm. Hmm. Uh, where you're there, but nothing's, there's no doing anywhere hmm. that you can detect. Yeah. So th- those are the ones uh, I can think of, but I'd also like to end with an example from a very different world. Yeah. I well, think. I just wanted to, to thinking about non-traditional yeah. ways. I mean, I use a practice.
practice or a two that I learned from Mia Morales's primal Alexander work. Okay, yeah. As the primary method to help people practice Mm -hmm. addition, which kind of starts off with the idea of pause but then becomes more than and hopefully can be something that's just you know like that <laughs> um so not, he not talks that... about he talks about noticing ease for example mm -hmm. Is, it, yeah. is that what you're talking about or something else yeah he has a little movement sequence where you practice pausing before each movement and then you add in during the pause you giving yourself a little doing a little bit of constructive thinking um mm -hmm. so you're practicing doing that before and then you are practicing doing it during and even after so you're practicing um inhibiting mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. in this kind of um, away away from your life that might mean that then when I go to reach my glass which I think is what any Alexander teacher would want that I might have a moment to like oh I'm not reaching for my glass if we're going to use a <laughs> um, a um, inhibitory paradoxical direction you know right, um, right. but you, you're actually taking it outside of life to practice it um, separately mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. kind of what I do these days and there was something else i want to mention and it's gone right now um oh yeah just the idea of saying no we were talking about traditional um alexander teaching on inhibition and that was something like saying no to a stimulus like mm -hmm. that internal that that idea um was used a lot in my you know early Alexander learning and training. So. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, saying no is a type of in is yeah. kind of inhibition. Yeah. 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 I think uh, Patrick McDonald, uh, when he would teach, he would say things like, okay, uh, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna take you into the chair from standing, let's say. Okay. And okay. your job is to say no right uh -huh. but the thing is if you said no in the wrong way he'd get really angry. yeah exactly like yes. you could like become immobile um but it's yeah. like you're not going to do anything to help in, in that that's what it means in that situation yeah, that's what yeah. he meant by it but yeah i i can remember some interesting interactions with him <laughs> on that in that ground but i think that was a way that he was teaching inhibition mm -hmm. yes as opposed to maybe like a someone like Walter Carrington, who relied much more, I think, on just his basic being and personality. He was like this person that being in his presence, you were kind of it would kind of chill you out you know I'm, and, I'm i never actually got to work with him but from what you've said and what i've heard other people say you could kind of like he was oozing inhibition and it was just yeah. he was losing it he was losing serenity and everything being okayness and mm -hmm. he i once asked him uh about when he would first start uh oh help uh, giving people let's say homework assignments to do when they came to him for private lessons. Uh -huh. And he told me, and it was it, it's always stayed with me because it's really his approach. He would do anything he possibly could do for the first 10 lessons to avoid any talk about the Alexander technique. <laughs> he wanted to just give people the experience. Uh -huh. And I think for his clientele, that might have been a pretty good strategy. It's not one that, that I use particularly, but that's that was his strategy. Get them get him chilled out. And then, then you could start talking about directions and stuff like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh, so that uh -huh. was it. That was his uh -huh. approach. Anything else you can think of? No, things may come to me afterwards, and I'm sure, you know, of people, teachers watching, and maybe students who are watching may chip in with their own ideas of activities or how they were taught it and 
how, how they teach it, et cetera, et cetera. So. Well, I want to end with an example that is from a completely different universe than the Alexander Technique. And I think okay. it's one that your husband would appreciate because it's from the world of chemistry. Okay. A chemist, right? <laughs> He's a chemic, yes, he's a chemical physicist or a physical chemist. He's a chemist he will, and a physicist. <laughs> well, he will know about this. Okay. So this is an example. This is uh, from the field of organic chemistry, which I think most people who know about it think will, will may remember it as a class that you had to take uh, if you were going to become a go to medical school you need it as an undergraduate to take a course in organic chemistry. And that was a horrible experience for the majority of people who did it. Um, I never did. I, I never had the pleasure being oh, in the British university system. Absolutely <laughs> dreadful experience. Um, but in, in organic chemistry, the kind of built the fundamental building block of organic chemistry is called the benzene ring and it is like it's uh it it, it kind of underlies the structure of all, all of organic chemistry but it, for a long time no one knew it was a ring and no one knew what its structure was until a German chemist whose name is August Kekule. I think I think I've got that right. Uh, discovered it, and how he discovered it is uh, there are different versions of it, but um, one is that he was getting off a horse-drawn. Um, omnibus in London okay. and as he stepped off the bus it came to him and an image of uh, could be like um, uh, and he describes it uh, some, sometimes as he, he was like in a reverie uh, and he had a he saw snakes chasing each other in a circle <laughs> And that gave him the idea of the benzene ring. Uh, sometimes there, it's said that it's like other animals chasing each other in a, in a circle. But basically what happened is he sort of was obviously not thinking about chemistry when he got off the bus. And he was maybe in some place in his head where an idea like that could just pop into his brain and he would know what to do with it you know now that's not that not useful for most of us to cultivate but it, i think it's an example a kind of an example of a kind of version of inhibition that well, he engaged in you've you've made me think about um you know, if you're trying, trying to, I don't know, write a blog or but you sit down at your desk, I have to do it. I've got what I, and then you go and take a walk or you're in the shower and then the ideas come and you've it, somehow you it flows together. And there is there have been studies that we need these kind of open times when our mind can just wander and it gives the space maybe the space is the inhibition the space right. to to actually pull these ideas together or whatever it is or come up with the solution to the problem which when you were trying to find it and gaining perhaps or right. overly focused right. you know so having these spaces in our lives yeah, that's interesting. Um, I haven't quite related it exactly to inhibition, but just knowing that having these times when we're not sort of on task can actually help us be more creative, productive, you know, because it, 
actually gives the space right. for those things to, to happen. Right. And it's not that all your previous work was wasted. Mm -hmm. It's just that, like, as you say, you, you take a break from ideas about a blog and take a shower. All, those ideas recede very much into the mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. And many of them may have been good ideas, but maybe some of them were a little limiting in some mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you just, they all sort of float away and then, oh, wow, hey, I, I know how to do it. I, I'm going to, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think you could get something similar to that. Maybe you could argue that certain kinds of dream states would get you there. Uh, I, I, uh, I had the weird experience, uh, and I don't know how relevant this is, but I'm going to throw it out anyway. Uh, when I first, uh, not my very first semester, but the second semester of uh, my Alexander training, um, for about a two month period, I had a number of what I would describe as precognitive dreams, which is, I, it felt, they felt different from regular dreams. Mm -hmm. and, it was strike. It had sort of a striking quality to them. I'd never had dreams like that before, and I really haven't had very many since. And the thing, the thing is that of the three, two of them that were very specific came true, and they were. Uh, there was no way I could have consciously ha had any awareness of that. Hmm. They were highly specific events. And uh, they came true within a, few, a week or two of my dream. So, I mean, who knows? But I think in that state, I kind of, I wasn't, I wasn't putting any of the usual barriers into getting information for wherever you get that kind of information and out popped mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a prediction of the future that was accurate. So. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It does make me think about, you know, that kind of state when you've woken up, but you're not kind of fully awake, but your mind's sort of going here, there and everywhere. Yeah. And often it's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So anything else that you want to say about inhibition? your big chance um, I, that was my i don't think i was inhibiting i was saying try so that's actually so this is my you know when you try to think of something or like you're mm -hmm. trying to remember someone's name but it's when you've gone away and you're not trying anymore that suddenly it that just thing just yeah. comes so that will probably happen so you inhibit in case you uh, in that example you just gave mm -hmm. you could say well I was not maybe consciously deciding to inhibit, but I essentially inhibited the trying the to get to remember mm -hmm. that name. And yeah. that maybe cleared the path for the name to just mm -hmm. pop into your yeah. yeah. conscious awareness. Yeah. Because so. you were, instead of being in a narrow focus, you were in an open. Exactly. Space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think. Our conversation, I, I'd like to think of it as just food for thought. I mean, I, I'd certainly, I'm sure you would agree with me. It'd be fun to get some comments on this, right? And because uh, this isn't the definitive podcast on inhibition. By <laughs> Absolutely not. And we actually didn't really try and define it very Specifically. Uh, we could. You want to yeah. give your definition? No, we'll leave that for now. <laughs> I wasn't trying to. I was actually feeling like we're just leaving it. I think it was nice to leave it yeah. open. You know. Yeah, and there are lots of definitions of inhibition out there for anyone who wants to mm -hmm. read about them. But I think in a way, it's something that's it's a tough thing to actually define precisely. It's my sense. Anyway, anything you want to add? No. <laughs> I was like, you were I, could, right? I, could, I could try and then I could inhibit. I think my, you were no. inhibiting just yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll end, we'll end on that note. Um, I guess 
uh, today is, has been Imogen Ragone, an Alexander teacher in Wilmington, Delaware. I'll put a link to her website by the interview, and there'll be some more information there as well. Imogen, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.